Hello. Welcome to here. My name is Brienne Worth and I'm going to explain you a thing or 12 about Chernobyl. I have had a few drinks. We're not gonna lie. So I'm gonna explain to you the science and history behind Chernobyl and radiation in general, and to make it a little bit harder for myself, I'm gonna be drunk, which we've already ticked off. Now there's a lot of conversations to be had about binge drinking, and that's certainly not the culture that I wanna create on this channel. However, for the sake of tricking the youth into listening to me talk about science for 15 minutes, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm drunk. We're having some beers. We're just having some beers. We'll probably have a shot as well before we start. All right, and we're gonna whoop, not spill this shot. I've also got a flu, so that's probably where that's probably where the biggest issue is. Now I'm gonna be winging this a little bit, but so we're gonna break this down into some parts. Part one: What the f even happened at Chernobyl? The long and the short of it, basically, there was a nuclear power plant. How are we going to make this video? There was a nuclear power plant in the Ukraine which was poorly built and managed by people who understand nuclear power less than you're about to just watching this video. Reactor number four in that power plant basically just went arse over titty and exploded. Shit absolutely hit the fan, sending radioactive material into the atmosphere and spreading over a decent chunk of Europe. This basically forced like a hundred thousand people or more, I don't really know, to be evacuated and gave birth to the most comical solution to a man-made disaster ever which was just that they constructed a gigantic building over their enormous fuck up and hoped that that would fix it. It didn't. There's also a thing called the elephant's foot down there, which can kill you even if you look at it, which is pretty metal. I'm not sure I've ever been more of a fan of an inanimate object ever in my life. The elephant's foot definitely has big dick energy, but we will get to that later. But we want to know the juicy bits. What's the tea, sis? <laughs> Just imagine this for a quick second, right? It's 1986. You're a nuclear power reactor. You're just trying to chill and supply like give or take 10% of the Ukraine's energy. But you're also a pawn in an elaborate game of corruption and an incredibly blasé brand of greed considering nuclear power is involved. Your name is nuclear reactor number four. That's enough. The night that the safety of reactor... The night that Reactor 4 in the Chernobyl power plant exploded, a safety test was basically being conducted. Little did pretty much anyone working in the plant know, the RBMK-1000 reactor design was fundamentally flawed and only really used in the Soviet Union. The design, if I were to sum it up, a complete shit show, and we will get to that in just a second. Nuclear power plants basically just generate steam, that's more or less the end goal. Heat is created through nuclear fission, which comes about through the splitting of the uranium-235 atom, which then releases all of the atom's energy and heat. That heat boils water, which then turns into steam, which then spins turbines, which creates electricity. Now, the splitting of atoms is inherently quite volatile, as one could imagine. And they're all a bunch of sheep and can't think for themselves, maybe because they don't have a brain or a central nervous system. So one split atom kind of causes other atoms to split. Think of it as the most tiny, intense form of peer pressure ever. A chain reaction begins and more fission reactions create even more fission reactions and it creates this kind of explosive energy, which is actually the same kind of energy that fuels the nuclear fusion reactions in nuclear bombs. And nuclear fusion is more or less the exact opposite reaction where like lightweight nuclei are exposed to really, really high temperatures and then they fuse together rather than splitting and still create an explosive energy. So ideally, this is all like a brand of crazy that you don't really want floating around causing a ruckus in a power plant more or less. So to control this reaction in a power plant, the aptly named control rods are used. They absorb neutrons released during fission to slow down the rate of said fission. Savvy? So the RBMK reactor design that was used at Chernobyl is more or less like a large vessel containing nuclear material known as the core, which is cooled down using a circulating supply of water. That's quite important to remember. It uses water to both generate steam and cool down the core because water is one versatile bitch. And crucially, the control rods used at Chernobyl at the time were made of uh, neutron absorbing boron, but they were tipped with graphite to cut costs. Also quite important to this story. The boron does its job and slows the fission reaction, which is great. That's exactly what we want. However, the graphite kind of speeds it up for a little bit. How long? A bit. Get like give or take. Too long, obviously, because the bitch exploded. To call this a design flaw would be an insult to design flaws. On all accounts, chucking the graphite on the end there, bit of a f up. 
not gonna lie. Look, I'm not a scientist or an engineer, but I personally wouldn't put a material that has a tendency to speed up nuclear fission in an instrument that is designed to slow it down. That's just my two cents. So it's April 20 whatever, I don't know, we're not here for the accuracy of the Gregorian calendar. The nuclear bros at reactor number four are conducting like a little experiment eh, for safety, ironically. If you remember like a minute ago, I said the core was cooled down using flowing water. So if the power ever went out, the water would stop flowing, nuclear fission would continue, but you'd have nothing to cool down those little hot-headed nuclei and you'd find things going a little bit pear-shaped fairly quickly. That's not good, is it? In come the backup generators, said the Soviet Union. Except these generators take about 60 seconds to actually get their shit together and do their job properly still much faster than most of the Australian workforce. So somehow these scientists managed to identify that this minute long gap was a disaster waiting to happen, but couldn't quite put their finger on the fact that maybe chucking graphite that increases nuclear fission into a control rod was a bad idea. They wanted to test if the residual spin from the diesel generators powering down after a blackout could be used to bridge that minute long gap. That's what the safety test was. So that's how our RBMK reactor works and is designed. That's what the safety test was testing. Now we're at the juicy bit. Here's the Goss, the 411, the birth of the elephant's foot, bless be his radioactive camera shy soul. During the safety test, I'd just like to list off all the things that the workers turned off. The workers disabled the emergency core cooling system, the automatic control system, and the emergency power reduction system. The plant's computers were meant to lower the control rods into the reactor to completely stop the fission. The workers though, having turned all of that apparently useless shit off, took manual control and decided that out of the 211 control rods in there, they're going to take out all but 18 of them. Safety standards at the time dictated that you needed a minimum of 28 control rods in the core. But why do that when you can do the opposite of that? <laughs> a Soviet chemist named Valery Legasov... Legasov? Legasov. Let's pretend we've said that correctly. He described this situation pretty well by saying it was like airplane pilots experimenting with the engines mid-flight. Yeah. On all accounts, just not something you would really typically do if you had three functioning brain cells. However, the way that the whole world tends to lean towards bureaucratic incompetence would lead you to conclude that perhaps it wasn't the worker's idea to do all of this. It most likely came from higher up in the ladder from people trying to get the test done quickly. Because that's how shit works, baby. But even in that case, at any other reactor in the world, this wouldn't have been able to happen. Like this level of an incident probably couldn't have happened at any other reactor because as we've discussed, the RBMK reactor design was fundamentally cooked. So 40 seconds after this nuclear piss up of a safety experiment started, someone pressed the emergency shutdown button and we still don't really know why. And this was supposed to lower the rods into the core and shut the whole party down basically. Now, as we now know, the graphite tipped rods caused a reaction and kind of split the rods and jammed them a third of the way into their journey, which means no bueno for stopping nuclear fission. More steam was being created from the graphite being plunged into the cooling water than the system could vent. Fission reactions are still balls to the wall at this point with no parental guidance to stop them. All of this pressure basically caused fuel lines to rupture and explode out of the roof of the reactor. Huge chunks of graphite came out as well and on comes the spewing of insane amounts of radiation out into the atmosphere, which honestly is more or less where you don't want radioactive material most of the time if you can help it. <laughs> also the plant's obviously on fire at this stage, if that wasn't clear. <laughs> now this shit burnt uncontrolled for like two weeks. That's a lot of radiation. <laughs> now, how much radiation did this bad boy release? Heaps. Like, so much. Way more than you'd ideally like to release on a Saturday. There are varying accounts for what the radiation levels were, but doses for the first day were estimated to range up to 20,000 millisieverts. Now, for comparison, one millisievert is a thousand microsieverts. Let's Google this. It is. One millisievert is a thousand microsieverts, and your normal annual level of background radiation is 2,000 microsieverts. So divide that by that, and more or less, you get a fuck ton of radiation that no one's really that keen on. Now, this radioactive cloud of shite basically spread over a large part of Europe and in a 2011 report by the, wait for it, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, which is far too big of a name, they basically said that Chernobyl resulted in radioactive material becoming widely dispersed and deposited throughout the northern hemisphere. Heaps of radiation, a very large area affected, bada bing bada boom, we got a 30 kilometer exclusion zone around Chernobyl and like 300,000 people were evacuated more or less. The Red Forest, which is a forest near the Chernobyl power plant, uh, was cut down and buried underneath itself to apparently fix the problem. Um, and even today, the trees that are growing back are still super radioactive. Animals living in that forest that eat the radioactive plants are also radioactive. And it could be tens of thousands of years before these radioactive hotspots are safe to humans for 
for humans to live in there again. You will be a lizard person if you live there. If you're still with us, you might be wondering why radiation is just such a huge mood. I know some people like to run around saying all radiation is bad and all radiation is dangerous, but that's some A-grade bullshit because surprise, bitch, light is radiation, color is radiation, radio, microwaves, it's all radiation. It all sits on the electromagnetic spectrum. But there are two types of radiation, ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing radiation examples are like light, heat, uh, radar, radio, microwaves, which more or less stir up the matter that they pass through like the shit stirrers they are, but they don't break molecular bonds or remove electrons from atoms. Ionizing radiation, on the other hand, is more or less like the school bully and just wants to f your life up. It passes through matter and does break molecular bonds and also removes and displaces atoms, which is not great for you. X-rays and cosmic rays are an example of this specific breed of asshole. Obviously if this shit passes through the complex living body of like a plant or an animal or a human, which are animals, then it can do a number on your cells and how they function. Your cells can be impaired or damaged through the ionizing radiation passing through your DNA, which can tend to be fairly important. Or sometimes damage can be done indirectly, for example, breaking down water molecules into hydrogen and hydroxyl, also known as free radicals, bro, which can recombine as hydrogen peroxide, which will then damage your cells because who wants bleach in their gastrointestinal system? So going back to your annual dose of natural background radiation, even though I did say x-rays can be a molecule destroying asshole, which they can be. Everything exists on a duality and it turns out the human body can cop a little bit of ionizing radiation before it becomes too much of a problem, which is why you can recover from getting an x-ray fairly easily, but not like 3000 x-rays at the same time you feel. This video is going to be so long. And another thing, <laughs> there are a number of arguments to be had about how and why nuclear power is or is not safe. Nuclear power if it's done properly and if there's like no natural disasters, for example, is very safe statistically. However, as Chernobyl and the general corruption in society and corporations in general will tell you, there's no real guarantee that things are gonna be done properly. And that's largely just where the risk opens up. Australia is a slut for coal. Coal is unarguably less safe than nuclear power, both in the short term because it's responsible for far more worker deaths and accidents than nuclear power, but also and especially once you take into consideration the long term effects on workers and the environment and the general health of the world as a whole. Coal can be consistently and reliably far more dangerous to everybody, but in a much more clandestine way than nuclear power is dangerous. Nuclear power statistically has a much smaller risk, but the perceived risk is so much bigger. It's literally just a branding issue because when nuclear power does f up, it really, really f***s up. My main personal problem with nuclear power, other than the possibly dodgy contingency plans, is uh, more so about what the fresh hell we do with nuclear waste, because we can't just keep burying it and pretending it doesn't exist. Finland so far has a plan for nuclear waste storage, not disposal, which is basically that they're gonna build like a deep underground labyrinth of tunnels and put the waste down there in the hopes that no one will likely find it. It's not a great plan, but it is the best we've got right now. And it's better than what we normally do, which is just cover it in concrete and hope for the best. Looking directly at you, Bikini Atoll and the US government. <laughs> Speaking of nuclear waste, I'm gonna end the video on my absolute favorite part of this Chernobyl incident, which is in hindsight, just then not a great sentence. The elephant's foot. My boy. The elephant's foot is a large mass of crap that leaked out of reactor four and kind of just sits in this giant heavy mound that if you were high, you could look at and think that looks like an elephant's foot. Back in the day, 30 seconds of being near this bad boy could kill you. The photos I were able to take of it looks like something you'd find on your camera roll after a drunk night out because it's that blurry. And it's that blurry because the elephant's foot is so radioactive it was messing with the camera film. The dude in this photo is so dead. It's not even funny how dead he is. Is. If you even looked at it, if you were in a position where you could look at the elephant's foot, it would kill you. These days though, the radiation from the elephant's foot is only lethal after about 300 seconds, which is still terrifying. This is and I'm willing to bet about 10 bucks on this. This is the most dangerous room in the entire world. There is no hotter mess than the elephant's foot on all accounts. He is a big boy. Okay, look, if you're still here, go follow me on Instagram at Brienne Worth. That's a very hot beer, that is. I give shout outs every single video to people who follow me on Instagram, and I also give shout outs to people who subscribe and put the notification bell on. I'm incredibly shocked that that came out as a sentence. While Instagram loads, I have a clothing brand, Rift Supply Co. We have these paranoid hats in, and we just got beanies in as well. And Instagram shout outs come from this post, and they go to all three, four, five, two, three, six, Jesus. Sammy M001, Ruby Mac2, JRoy2, Pacey Sky, Bailey Smith7, Brianna Zoe, out.
It's okay. YouTube shoutouts go to Indra Lambeth, Valerie Val, Phoebe Ann, Mystic Guava, Jesse Johns, and Sienna Delaney. Thank you for having the bell on, commenting, etc. Etc. to the power of two. I need to go. We're gonna go. Bye. <laughs>